right. Can y'all see that? Yes. Make it a little bit bigger. What we want to talk about um, this morning is the character of true discipleship. Um, and this first piece, you know, I kind of took from my pastor and myself, we kind of put this together. And we read Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And there's a lot of um, good teaching in that verse to help guide us with discipleship. So I'm going to read it. And this is from the New Living Translation. The first disciples. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were, were full of fish, were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed him. When we look at um, discipleship, it is quite unfortunate that the church of today has failed to educate people on what it truly means to be a disciple. Too many times we extend membership to people and we don't extend relationship to people. And not only do we not extend relationship, but we fail to teach the people in the church about discipleship and what happens what has happened over a period of years and time we now have churches that are full of converts those are people who have found it necessary to make jesus savior but not to make him lord and, and let me throw this in parenthetically that is not an option that has been given to us in scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we are allowed to make Jesus savior. And later on in life, when we decide it's time that we make him Lord. And this has caused a great deterioration in the church. It's called, we've been focusing on membership, not relationship and not discipleship. With us coming to grips with the fact that teachings on true relationship and discipleship are greatly undertaught to the point where Christians have become shallow water Christians. If anybody's ever been to the beach, you know, in the shallow water, Deacon Hardy, that's where the little fish are. Yes. But when you launch out into the deep, that is where the big fish are. But many of us are content to play in shallow waters. Hmm. And we very rarely venture out into the deep. And like I stated, we understand in the deep is where the big fish are. So when we look at this text, and this is the foundation of how we're going to build upon for discipleship, when we look at the text, Shallow water Christians 
only show up when Jesus show up. Y'all got that? Shallow water Christians don't develop the character of true discipleship. Mm. They don't develop the character of true di discipleship because the only time they have an encounter with Jesus is when they come to church. And we truly understand that Jesus has told us that discipleship is not easy. In fact, discipleship is quite hard. He said in the Bible, if you want to be my disciple, you must first deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me daily. To deny yourself is to understand that it's not about you. What we do is not about us. It's about him. You have to understand that discipleship is us agreeing to go along with Jesus on his mission not bringing Jesus on our personal mission. But also when we say we have to take up our cross, we understand that it's not about us, but yet it's going to be some suffering along the way. And we must be willing to follow him daily. But like I stated, most believers just want to be shallow water Christians. When we talk about shallow water Christians, when we look at the text, we have Jesus preaching, and while he was preaching, what were they doing? They were in their boats, and they were mending their nets. They were not paying attention totally to what Jesus was saying. And when Jesus comes into town, they are with Jesus. But when Jesus goes away, he goes away on his own. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we must come to understand that yesterday's failures should not keep us from success today. Are y'all with me? Amen. If you can do it on your own, it doesn't grow your faith. So what happens when believers launch out into the deep? Believers get revelation of who Jesus is. When Simon Peter follows Jesus, he understands that Jesus is more than just an acquaintance. He understands that Jesus is essential to life. And we must understand as disciples that Jesus is essential. Jesus becomes vital and Jesus becomes real in the life of Simon Peter. We must launch out into the deep. And what that means is that we must begin to go beyond what is comfortable to us. And we must go beyond our daily routines. To do this, we must understand a few things. Jesus is the only one who can deliver us. Jesus is the only one that can guide us. Jesus is the only one who can protect us. Jesus is the only one that can make a way for us when it seems like there is no way. So we have to understand the believer gets a revelation of who Jesus is when we walk as disciples. Number two, it gives us a new revelation of who we are. When we know Christ and we truly see Christ for who he is, this revelation by the aid of the Holy Spirit causes us to see ourselves as we truly are. Sometimes we think we're bigger than life. But when we compare, when we see ourselves standing next to an all-sufficient Savior, we see ourselves for who we are. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. We have to understand the fishermen went out at the word of Jesus. The disciples go out at the word of Jesus. The fishermen had to go, with, go out where they were, and they went to the depths at, that they were at. And they moved when they received a word of instruction and a word of direction from Jesus, because guess what? Jesus knows where the fish are. So we think we know where the fish are, but we have to make sure that we are connected to Christ 
So, because Jesus knows where the fish are. Number three, we commit ourselves to the cause of Christ. And this goes back to my sermon from last week. And we must do it immediately. When we commit ourselves, we are acknowledging that there is more success in following Christ than doing what we want to do. I'm going to say that one more time, Deacon Hardy. When we, when we commit ourselves, when we commit ourselves, we are acknowledging that there's more success in following Christ than doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. The fishermen learn there is a greater reward following Christ and obeying Christ than mending their nets and cleaning their boats. Too many times we are caught mending our nets and cleaning our boats when we need to be following Jesus Christ. Because remember, they caught nothing the night before. But at the word of Jesus and obeying Jesus, they caught fish. I want you to understand Peter's success when he obeyed Jesus humbled him. Our success when we obey Jesus should humble us. Our success in Christ will and shall humble us. Understand this. I want you to hear me closely. The fish that they caught were alive, but would soon die. However, my brothers and my sisters, as fishers of men, the souls they would catch would be dead in sin, but made alive in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you have done or how much sinking. Uh, the good news today is that God can and God will bring you out. It doesn't matter. Your past doesn't matter. You have to understand that God can and God will bring you out. But we have to make him first. Because that is where our success will be. So as we engage the discipleship making process, we must put God first. Because that is where the success is. One day, Peter, James, and John experienced failures. And the next day with Jesus, they found success. Now, I wanted to talk about understanding discipleship. And then I'm going to let you guys go. We are a fellowship, and we have churches, and anytime we gather a group of people together to accomplish a goal, everybody needs to be on the same page. In the church, if, we, if we're going to accomplish discipleship, fellowship, and relationship, we have to be on the same page. So in order for us to be on the same page, I want you all to catch this. We need to define what we want to accomplish. And we need to define how we're going to go about accomplishing it. So if we want discipleship and we want fellowship, we have to get everybody on the same page to make sure that this is what they want. And we have to define Define what we want to accomplish, and we have to define how we're going to accomplish it. Most of us are familiar with sports. And when we're playing sports, we have to work as a unit. Here in the notes, we talk about football. When a quarterback gathers the other players in a huddle and calls out slants 86, double cross 99, right? Every other player needs to know what the play that the play that the quarterback is talking about. They not only do they need to know the play, but they need to know how they play a part in the play. Otherwise, when the huddle breaks, it's going to be chaos. You got to understand the if it's basketball, you got to understand the play. If you're breaking a press, you got to understand how to break the press and what your role is in breaking the press. But the same principle is true. 
for sailors navigating a ship, for workers assembling cars at a factory, for soldiers advancing on the enemy, or for a band playing music. Everybody has to understand their part in the process. Are y'all with me? So in the church, everybody has to understand their part. And I, and I guarantee you, at your churches, everybody does not understand their part. I also guarantee that everybody has not agreed on what the purpose is. And see, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church never changes. The purpose of the church is to make disciples. Everything else is secondary. Our goal when we go to church is to be equipped and equip other people to make disciples. When we gather as a fellowship, our goal is to be equipped and equip others to make disciples. Whenever a group sets out to work together to accomplish a goal, the tasks, methods, and objectives need to be defined. So in discipleship, it's not just put. It's not just taking people in your church and sending them out. The goals, the tasks, the method, the methods, and the objectives need to be defined, and they must be clearly communicated and understood by everybody involved. This is the key statement in your notes right here. And let me just ask these questions: Have you applied? this common sense principle to your church. In your gut level, honest times of self-assessment, is every leader in your church or in your fellowship on the same page? Does everybody in your church or your fellowship agree on what success looks like? Does everybody understand the purpose of the church? is that the purpose of the church is to make disciples. Does everybody understand what a disciple is? Do they, do they know the difference between a disciple and a convert? Convert or disciple? What's the difference between making converts and making disciples? Understand that a church must correctively define a disciple before it can move forward in making disciples. I'm going to say that one more time. You have to clearly define what a disciple is before you start making disciples. Understand that conversion is the first step in the discipleship process. A convert is one who turns around, meaning a person is moving one direction but becomes convicted of sin, turns the other direction, and comes to Christ. By simple faith, the person receives the gifts of salvation. Conversion, my brothers and my sisters, is the beginning of the journey, whereas discipleship is ongoing. In true conversion, a person must commit to following Jesus. A person becomes a lifelong learner, which is a disciple. So a disciple is defined as a lifelong learner from Jesus Christ. Be being a disciple is a learning process that never ends. One of the, one of the biggest killers is to say, I already know that. We are always learners. We should always be growing and we should always be striving to be connected to the true vine. I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't really think that we'll ever truly finish learning since we're finite creatures and God is infinite. And I think one of the things as we continue to grow and even as we transition to heaven, that's one of the things that will make it exciting. We always will be learning. We'll continue to learn and discover more riches of the grace of God. But like I stated before, the problem in our churches today is that they're full of converts. So the question is, how do we disciple converts? 
we find that in chapter in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, where it says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, it is just by coincidence that I happened to preach this this past Sunday. So there are three things in this verse that are going to bless us on today and help springboard us into becoming better disciples and better disciple makers. Follow me. Jesus said, follow me. A disciple must of Jesus must follow Jesus. It's as simple. As simple as this. Jesus leads, we follow. But follow me, Bishop Covington, is a word of invitation. So I want you to write that down. It's a word of invitation. Following means that we recognize and accept Jesus as Lord, leader, and master of our lives. He is the one who initiates and guides. In turn, we respond to his leadership and direction. Following Jesus means we have acknowledged that Jesus is at the front and we are at the uh, we are behind Jesus. John 12, 26 speaks of this process. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. We have to understand as we follow Jesus, we are following Jesus on his mission. But follow me is a word of invitation. Number two. And I will make you. That is a word of transformation. So, so far we have invitation. We have transformation. It tells us that discipleship involves Jesus molding our hearts to become more like his heart. Jesus invites us to follow him. And he says he will make us into fishers of men. In other words, the disciple of Jesus Christ is changed by Jesus Christ. Not only must we make a mental and heartfelt decision to follow Christ, there must be a process of transformation in which a work takes place in our hearts and our affections. Remember, God is the potter and we are the, are the clay, and we must have a willing heart to allow God to mold us and shape us into the vessel that he wants us to be, that is fit to be used by him for his business. Far too many of us assume that discipleship is merely the transfer of information leading to behavior modification. But discipleship at heart involves transformation at the deepest level of our understanding, affection, and will. And all this is done by the aid of the Holy Spirit through the word of God in relationship with the people of God. So we have a word of invitation. We have transformation. But the last part here, this is the high point. This is what I call the culmination. So we have the invitation, transformation. Now we have culmination. We become fishers of men. The final three words in this verse indicate a response to action. Something that affects what we live for, what we do, and what we will be willing to die for. If acceptance of Jesus begins in our head, and extends to our heart and leads to a change in what we do with our hands. In other words, a disciple is saved for a purpose. We were saved for a purpose. And it wasn't just to come to church to shout and dance and sing. We were placed here to be agents of transformation to those who are lost. We are not here to entertain one another. It is our mandate to go ye therefore to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. And what this means is that we join Jesus on his mission to love and to reach a lost and hurting world. Being on a mission 
means that we acknowledged that we are saved by God for a purpose. Our mission is not simply to come to church each Sunday. Our mission is just not to be nice to people and to cram a lot of biblical facts into their heads. It's not even to give money to the church so that the pastor can carry out the mission of Jesus Christ. It is for every disciple to join God's mission in the world, to participate with God's purpose in the world. This is discipleship. Understand, the world is hurting. Where you're at right now, people are hurting. Where you're at right now, people are dying. Where you're at right now, people are going to hell. And we can give no greater gift of love than to share the good news that brings people into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Inspired by Jesus, literally, we seek to love people and tell them what we have found in him. When we put all these three attributes together, and I'm almost done, is that following Jesus is in our head, being changed by Christ, our hearts, and being committed to the mission of Christ, our hands. It goes from our heads to our hearts to our hands. This is how we define disciples. And this is what this is what charges, this is what we need to be seeking to make in our churches. We need to be disciples first and foremost, but only disciples can make more disciples. Given the state of the church in America today, this requires a shift. That's why this book is called Disciple Shift, and that's why this class is called Disciple Shift. We have, to, we have to move from simply making converts in the church to reaching people and discipling them. So we, want, we do want them to be converted, but we have to engage in relationship and fellowship if we want to move to discipleship. Our goal is to present people as mature in Christ. That's our goal as church leaders, as leaders in the fellowship. Our goal is to present people as mature in Christ. Colossians 128. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present God to them perfect in their relationship to Christ. When this is the goal, when discipleship is truly the goal, everything changes. Are there any questions? Hello, not, not any questions, but let me just say what a wonderful teaching. Um, I love when you said, I'm still stuck on Jesus knows where the fish are, that part. <laughs> that that part right there, I'm going to be feasting off of that for a while. Um, and I love how you gave the football references and the basketball references. And you talked about how, you know, as parts of teams, we have to know our role. But it also says to me... Um, and we want to honor Bishop Moore on today. Thank you, Bishop Moore, for being here. Bless you, sir. We appreciate you. And Pastor Smitherman, bless you. So grateful you're here. Um, but also the leader has to clearly define the roles and, and make sure that they are followed. Because when we say kind of as a disciples, we have to follow if the leader has not defined the roles. If the leader has not said, this is what you all are to do and follow through with it, that's an issue. And the last thing I want to say is also, when you I think about football, there's a playbook. 
The other team don't know, you know, what the plays mm -hmm. are, but but that team, your team knows what the playbook is. And so the ones on the field aren't just running around doing things. There's a playbook and calls are, you know, the, the plays are being called. And so if we have a playbook and the leader isn't following the playbook, right, then in our churches and our ministries and wherever, then that's a problem. So I really think that as leaders, we must call the plays and we must make sure that everyone knows their role. Right. And one of the things that we talked about in the beginning is that we got to get everybody together to make sure that they are committed to it. Yes. Committed. Yeah. That's that yeah. word. Mm -hmm. It must be commitment. And we're going to go deeper. We, we, this is this is the beginning. We're going to go deeper. This is not just a one shot deal. We are probably going to be here for a while. Like I stated, there is a book and the book will, you know, it will give you a little more insight because we're going to got an overview things. But this will bless you as a disciple and bless your ministry. Amen. Yeah, this is uh, Deacon Hardy in Colorado Springs. I really enjoyed the uh, teaching this morning. Um, uh, one thing that stood out to me, and I, I want maybe you can give me a little bit more clarification. Um, when you spoke about shallow waters versus the deep waters, and what came to mind to me during that uh, topic was that the equipment that you use will definitely have to be different uh, when you're in shallow waters versus deep waters. And then uh, along with the shallow water Christians, versus the deep water Christians. Um, I just I just wanted to get uh, a, a more clear idea of what how to be equipped in the difference of shallow versus deep. I think well I, I can only go by my experience, my brother. And is that you have to you have to master what you're doing in the shallow water. Mm. It's like it's like um it's funny. I was I was talking about this in a joking way, but if we ever played a video game like Super Mario Brothers, mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody has everybody has played Super Mario Brothers, but there's level one, and you have to master everything on level one to get to level two. And if you want to go to level three, you have to master everything on level two to get to level level three. And one of the things we used to do. When we were younger, we would get cheat codes. So we can get the cheat codes and go all the way to the end to see if we could beat that final level. But you can't, what I realized is that we couldn't win on that final level because we hadn't won on the levels below. And so we, what we have to do as disciples is be able to master the level that God has us on. And once, and that's determined by God. That's not determined by us. And once we have mastered that level, then we level up, and then we're able to go out in the deep. And the reason why I say this, bro, is because see, I, I love to swim, and I love to swim in the deep. And see, when I go out into the deep, I don't have as much equipment with me as I would have if I was in the shallow water. All right. It's, it's so I had that. So so I, I I'm just just using this example. When we went, when we went to, uh, I think it was uh, Aruba, you know, everybody had their life jackets on. But because I was able to swim in the deep water, I didn't need no life jacket, even though I couldn't stand up. And so you have to be able to master it. And not only master it, you have to grow your spiritual muscles so you're able to withstand what's going to happen and your mental ability and, and, and everything as you endure. Because like I stated, you know, in the shallow water, that's where the little fish are. That's where everybody's standing. But out there where the deep is, deep fish, the, in the deep, that's where the big fish are. And for big fish, you're going to need more strength. You're going to need more durability. You're going to need, your, your mental capacity is going to have to be greater because, you know, a greater level, a greater devil. And so you just have to be able to master the things on the, on the lower level. So it's like going to Sunday school. You got to master Sunday school. You master the you no know, discipleship. You master relationships. You master this you, at every level. The fish get bigger. So what I so what I understand out of that is that you your spiritual equipment would have to be uh, mastered. So you would have to go out in the deep with a better spirit, be spiritually equipped mm -hmm. in order to uh, to get the big fish. Yes, Amen. It, it really equipped all the way around. 
not, yeah. not only must you be spiritually equipped, but you got to have knowledge too. You know, knowledge, and and I keep and I and this is one of the things. This is one of the things that keep coming up in my teaching and preaching. You got to be able to rely on the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So 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 what I'm saying is that you can't go out into the deep in your own strength. You can you can you can't go out just you can't go out in the deep as Tony. Right, right. You got to go out in the power, in the strength, and in, in, in the mindset of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, and, and, and but you have to equip yourself. And, and one of the things that we touched on in the in the lesson is that you can't just do it on Sunday morning. Now, I, 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 I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, "Look, if I made you." A big dinner tomorrow, Father's Day. I said, "Look, Tony, come on down to the basement of New Jerusalem, and you can have all that you want, whatever you want to eat, and everything is there in front of you." And then, but I said, "The only catch is you can't eat again till next Sunday." <laughs> that's crazy, and that's what a lot of people do at church. They want to come get all this from the pastor, and then they want to go home and not do anything. So, so, so disciples cannot be lazy folk. You got, you, we, have, we have to be in prayer. We have to be studying. We have to be growing. We have to be in fellowship. We have to be worshiping. And, and, and when I say worship, I'm not talking about going out there and dancing in your house. I'm talking about going out to a dying and sinful world and walking the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so we, so we have to grow. And we, it's just like working out. You, if you don't work out the muscles, they don't become strong. You have to work it out holistically, holistically. And our greatest practice is amongst our brothers and our sisters because they give us the most stress. And we love them, but we're going to be honest. They give us the most stress. So we grow in trees of righteousness by enduring the hardships of dealing with one another. And I'm not saying that folks are difficult, but just like we say folks are difficult, folks are going to say Larry's difficult. So, so, so we just have to learn to navigate one another and we grow. Thank you for that. You cleared up a lot. I really enjoyed the study this morning. I'm glad that I uh, chimed in and I uh, look forward to uh, continue to worship and learn with you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the book up too. Here it is. I'll put it in the chat. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to also, I love what you just said about learning to navigate one another. That is just so key because there are people that we find easier to navigate. You know, we understand their uh, personality. Maybe we have our personal jokes or we just get them. And then there are other people in the body of Christ and the fellowship in our church, wherever it is. And we just don't get it. We don't get their jokes. We don't get their personality. And so a lot of times we don't put the effort in. We avoid them. Um, we're easily angered. We have little patience. And we just decide, well, we're going to work with the people that are easier to work with are the ones that we get. And I feel like we stunt our growth that way. You know, just I love how you said just as we find some people difficult, some people find us difficult. And as we're avoiding others, people are avoiding us. Mm -hmm. and, I, <laughs> and you don't even realize sometimes that people are avoiding you or don't want to work with you or don't care for you. And so I think that it's really important that instead of just brushing people off, writing people off, saying, well, I don't care for them, that we really when is the last time you prayed and said, Lord, give me more patience with this person? Lord, uh, teach me how to work with this person. Everybody's work methods and ethics aren't the same as yours. And so even as I say this, I pray, I, I'm praying this for myself. Teach me how not just to work with the little group that I'm used to working with, but teach me how to work with everybody, to have patience with people's quirks. Because guess what? We have our own quirks. We have our own idiosyncrasies that we don't even realize. And so um, that really blessed me when you said that we have to learn how to navigate each other, understand each other, uh, and really have patience with each other. And I think when we do that, God will be pleased. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Somebody, somebody made that statement. 
um, the, about that. And the thing is, we have to be we have to be balanced. You know, it's a, it's, it's some it's it's some issue. I, I, I'll use myself as an example. It, it's some organizations I don't particularly care how they care for how they conduct things. So I find it easiest to go where you know I'm comfortable, right? Where it's cool, but we still have to have the same effort and the same love and the same passion that God has given us for the people, like you stated, that that we we cool with and the people that we not cool with. The organizations we cool with and the organizations we not cool with. We still have to come with the same strength and the same power. And it's not always easy. Because like I said, sometimes stuff rubs us the wrong way. But like I like I like I stated that you said it, you, you said it again. We rub folk the wrong way too. Come on now. And we and we got, you know, and, and, and it's something we, we call ourselves shifting some people. And like you stated, it's some folks shifting us. So, but we have to realize that you know, you know, we all we 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 should all be striving to be in fellowship with one another. And when I talk about fellowship, we are fellows in the same ship, and we should all be rowing the same direction and not drilling no holes in the ship. Amen. And so we, and so as we strive to grow in our discipleship, um, we, we're growing together, and we're learning together, so that we can become stronger. We can become, you know, transformed. We can be more of an influence that, that that affects our leadership, not only in our fellowships, in our churches, in our families, in our communities. The the gospel must go forth, and so that's what we're striving to do. Any more comments? As always, a blessing to see Bishop Moore on. Yes, it is our mentor. God bless y'all. Uh, it, just wonderful. I, I saw the notice late, and and uh, I wanted to jump in and just support in all ways possible. Uh, some things I I can't be a part of uh, myself uh, because of some of the activities and things that I'm doing. But but I saw this uh, as soon as I picked up my phone. I said, well, let me. Uh, let me shift in, in, in the things that I'm doing this morning. Yeah. And, um, and it's great. I, I, I'm enjoying uh, what I'm hearing. Uh, I think I've used the playbook analogy myself a few times, uh, but, but I really uh, enjoy what I just received because, you know, the navigation of people, you know, Jesus had to deal with a lot of, different types of people and you know he he wasn't picky he 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 didn't just have his inner circle uh he he had many types of people that he had to navigate and deal with and and uh learn of and things like that and that's the same thing that 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 we need to do and, you know you put in my spirit uh and, and i thank you for this and, and, and let me share this real quick. Let me share this real quick. Um, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the ministry, how long you've been a leader and everything. There's it's always good when you receive something. And, and, and I'm an avid educator and theologian, and, and I love receiving something in my spirit that, that, that that's fresh and new. And the fact that uh, we're, we're discipleship, in discipleship, we're... Each one of us must be moving in the right direction. Those that are part of our discipleship team and all. But the fact that there are some people that are in the boat causing water to seep in, that's powerful. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I, 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 I sat here and pictured uh, uh, the rowboat and we're all moving in the sea and somebody's in the back punching holes because that's not the direction they want to go. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so bless you this morning. <laughs> uh, both of you, <laughs> both you, uh, uh, Bishop Mosley and, uh, and, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Hubbard, 
uh, and, and each and every one of you. Uh, the comments are just great. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Bishop. Bless it's you. Always, it's always a pleasure. And what I did, I don't know if you all look, but there's a link. I do have a PDF of the notes, but I felt that um, you all having a link to it would be better. And that way you could do what you want to do with them. You can, you can shift them to a different document and uh, or share them with your church. Feel, feel free. I'm going to put it in there again so you have it. You have the Amazon link to the book, um, and you have the link to my notes for today. Um, are there any other questions or comments? If not, we could uh, get ready to begin this Father's Day weekend. I, I got a, I got a party going, getting ready to go on upstairs. <laughs> but yeah, so 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 you all know, D Deacon Hardy that, that joined us. That's my brother from another mother. You see, he getting on here trying to look like me today. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. We we met, we met, we, we spent like a weekend together. And we've been linked ever since. But he's out there by um, Overseer Gray. And I did put them in contact with each other. So we, you know, we all, you know, we all together. But that's my brother from another mother. God bless you. God bless you, uh, all the bishops that are on this morning. I feel like um, I'm standing among giants this morning. But uh, I tell you what, uh, I was truly blessed by this teaching. And uh, as Larry said, we are brothers from another mother, but we have the same father. And so <laughs> God be the glory. Um, uh, happy Father's Day to the fathers that are on. And uh, Sister Bishop, uh, it was good to hear your comments also. Uh, I'm getting ready to sign off, but uh, be blessed. We're about to sign off too, bro. We're going we to pray out. Is it okay? Amen. Yes. We're gonna go, I'm going to ask Bishop Desmond Elliott to, to uh, pray us out. Amen. Father God, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we come to you today thanking you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Oh God, we thank you that you have allowed us, oh God, to gather in this place, to be uh, on one accord, oh God, of one mind and making one sound. Oh God, we thank you for our instructor, Bishop Designate Dr. Mosley. God, continue to pour wisdom into him, oh God. Continue to allow him to preach in season, teach in season and out of season to cry loud and to spare not. We lift up Bishop Moore on today. We thank you for our mentor, our seat of wisdom. Continue to bless, continue to heal, continue to bless the work of his hand, continue to make every crooked path straight. Oh God, we thank you for everyone who heard this lesson, who will hear this lesson. And oh God, we thank you as we prepare to depart from this place, but never from your presence. Go with us. Stand by us until we meet again. We will forever give your name the praise of which it yes. is. And the people of God say amen. Amen. Say amen. amen. And we shout with a shout of triumph. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a great amen. weekend. Happy Father's Day to the fathers. I love you all. Well, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Bless you. All right. Be blessed. Thank Be blessed. you.